Well, here I am again, another year older. Yes, yesterday was my birthday, so I thought I'd chime in and make another video about the planetary boundaries and the ones that we've all crossed now. So, I don't know if anybody's watched Breaking Boundaries by Johan Rockström, who's a Swedish environmental scientist. And so he depicted, it's on Netflix. Great, great to watch, I highly recommend it. So. Let me, let me describe those. <laughs> so obviously everybody knows the climate change boundary we've passed. We're into the unknown zone now. Not that very high risk yet, but we're getting there. So that's planetary boundary number one. Second one is biodiversity loss. So of course with all the species primed for extinction now, you know, there's 8.7 million species on the planet. And I guess what? We're all going to be primed for extinction the more boundaries are crossed and or the more severe they get. Next one is land use alteration. So all the devastation that's happening on the terrestrial field here. Buildings for homes, commercial buildings, agricultural fields, destroying the Amazon, which I mentioned in the last video, which is outrageous. I mean, uh, Bolsonaro is just like, hey man, we gotta do, we gotta hit <laughs> we had to stop deforestation by 23 miles. We're just mowing it all down now. So the next... Oh, excuse me. Hold on. I want to touch base on this, too. So land degradation. Another thing, too, that's coming up. Unfortunately, it's going to be... I don't know. It's not too widespread yet, but deep sea mining. Does anybody know about that? Yeah, that's going to be a huge problem eventually. So... We have these nodules in the, on the ocean floor which contain cobalt, lithium, magnesium, zinc, aluminum, copper, and what's the last one? Mm, nickel. And so these are used for solar panels, electronic devices, tons of things that we use nowadays, electric vehicles, which is really sad. But I know Tesla's trying to find different ways to u utilize other precious metals or recycle them, which is great because if we take those those nodules from the, the ocean floor, what do you think is going to happen? We have no idea. We can just postulate what could occur. So the thing with that is is that it keeps it keeps the ocean, the sea floor in place. As one scientist um, described it, it's like sea ooze. Oh, that's kind of a weird way to say it, but it's like a soft silt layer below. And you have millions of these nodules keeping it in place. So what happens when you go have this ton, it's like one or two ton vacuum down there just sucking all that shit up. What's going to happen when that's disturbed? And all the animals that are down there too, like octopus, mm, fish, bacterial species, um, other organisms too. I don't even know. We don't even have a whole lot of information about that because it's, it's the deep, you know. <laughs> we still find species down there anyways. A lot of it's untouched, of course. Um, so... And then the whole process of that as well is that you have ships on the surface that send these funnels down. You have an intake and you have an outtake. So the one that goes down to the seafloor and that vacuum just sucks it all up. It goes up and then this funnel comes down the other side and just releases all that sediment to the water. So that's going to cause a lot of sediment to accumulate in the ocean. You know, as far as that's going to travel? Miles, no doubt. I mean, come on now. You have to think of all the species that breathe this water. So going in their gills, their their stomach, all throughout their bodies, the silt, you know, hasn't been disturbed before. What do you think is going to happen? Um, so it's going to pollute the waterways. Uh, what are the other side effects of that? Well, the ocean sequesters carbon. It captures carbon, you know, a lot more so than a lot of plants on land. And what's going to happen when those are taken out? It's probably going to reduce it greatly, very dramatically. And, you know, again, just like, like a lot of things, we... We experiment as we go. Like, we have... There's test pilots done. You know, one back in the 80s where they they took these out. I forgot the square footage of it. Maybe it was like a mile or something. Maybe not that big. But anyways, they did the study where they took all those out. And 80% of it has still not recovered to this day. 30 years, 30 something years later. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do that around every continent with all these sea nodules down there. I wonder what's going to happen to the, the bio... That's for integrity too. It's gonna plummet. Easy. <sighs> it's 
just another disaster waiting to happen. You know, it's like mining does here on the land. Sea mining is no different. No different at all. So, let's see. I got through those. What's the next one? Oh, yeah. Biogeo... Oh, that's a mouthful, apparently, if I can't even say it properly. Biogeochemical pathways. So that means things that are going throughout the environment. Abiotic factors and biotic factors. So living and non-living. You know, circulating things like, for example, when I drink water, I can make sure it's purified somehow, you know, get all the heavy metals out. And if not, all that passes through me, which I eventually pass through the environment again, and just cycles through. One big cycle. So all the things that are the chemicals and everything else that goes through all of us and just repeats, just keeps being recycled through as, as such as life. Like another example, when I croak eventually, you know, my body's gonna turn to ash. I'm gonna go fertilize something else. Hopefully I'll be under a tree, fertilizing that <laughs> rather than being cremated, which should just, you know, waste a waste of uh, resources too. So I'd rather, I'd rather help tree live than be burned to a crisp. Uh, so, you know, my ashes will return back to the earth and then just keep going, keep cycling through. Be repurposed. Um, okay, so I got those four. Those are the ones that are being crossed already. Those, These are approaching the, the danger zone. So the rest of them, ocean acidification, which everybody knows what happens with that, with coral bleaching. And another thing too is that these, these microorganisms like plankton and crustaceans and other creatures that utilize calcium carbonate in their environment, they're not able to anymore because that calcium is leached from acidification. Uh, let's see. So the other one, stratospheric ozone depletion, which, oh yeah, I mentioned the other video. <laughs> I overshot that way too much. I meant kilometers, not miles, which is great because, yeah, we're, 23 square million square miles would be enormous. So it's actually the third of that. <laughs> 23 million kilometers. Excuse me. Uh, another one. Another part of the, the list here. Aerosol loading into the atmosphere. So all the things that, you know, we pump out into the environment. Whether it's CO2 or bromine or methane, carbon dioxide, toxins. Like, we don't have... CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons anymore, which unfortunately used to be my uh, buterol medication I, I used to take for asthma when I had a lot of problems as a kid, but things like that. Or what was it, air conditioners had them, refrigerators, so they had to actually remove that because it was depleting the ozone on a grand scale. But anyways, you have to think about everything else that depletes the ozone, so aerosol loading, whatever that might be, which is a ton of things. Um, let's see, the other, other couple... Mm, hydrologic cycle, of course, things that just get cycled through, the degradation of the water system, which, <laughs> another thing too, I I was out hiking with my dog one day and we went to this riparian habitat, mm, pretty nice actually, although it's still pretty dry even in spite of getting rain, you know, uh, we were walking out in this area and I don't know what it was, but this place has been polluted numerous times we've gone there, so I don't know if it's agriculture runoff or from the homes that were built over there. I'm not really sure what it was, and so I actually pointed out to a couple people that were letting their dog run amok in the water, and I said, whoa, please do not let your dog run in that anymore, and when you get home, make sure you clean that animal, and the bottom of your shoes too, because I don't know what this stuff is. Hydrocarbons, pesticides, I don't know. I wish I had a sampling kit <laughs> I could take out with me and just, well, oh, here's a list of what's in that. And so, yeah, that's uh, everywhere. You know, tons of places. That was definitely not the first one I've encountered. Um, and last but not least, oh yeah, unknown entities. So, so the, that's all the pollution in the environment, nanoparticles, microplastics, uh, organic pollutants, all that stuff. So... Yikes. <laughs> crossing, crossing four out of nine planetary boundaries already. Yeah, I definitely watched that video. It's a great one. I was uh, hmm, saddened to watch it, but not surprised at all. Although I was kind of surprised that we haven't crossed more than just four because of what's happening anyways around us. And, you know, climatic events are increasing. But I just saw something yesterday about flooding in Europe. I mean, cars is happening everywhere, I'm sure, but it's always something new in the news, right? Um, hmm. 
Let's see. It's like there's always so much, so many things to talk about, man. When I'm on the spot, sometimes I just forget. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna bring up this, 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 this. this. What else? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know, maybe I'll make it short today. But, yeah, that was something to definitely consider. Because we have to. So, again, I'm, I'm always saying, please watch your output, what you do, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know, well, I mean, I have some other things kind of related, also not related to talk about, but... Um, another... I mean, I could bring up this book. Why not? I'll start reading this. This is actually really great. It's by... <laughs> this is a health for our dogs. Which, in turn, helps you, your own health, and the health of the environment as well. You know, so yeah. The Forever Dog by Dr. Karen Becker and Rodney Habib. Habib. It's about changing up the foods you can feed your animals. And, you know, you can actually feed your dogs mushrooms. You can eat all the mushrooms that we do. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And... You know, tons of vegetables, cruciferous ones, like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, things like that. Mm. You know, they should be organic. Just, all this plays a factor in, into everything. When you source organic foods to feed your animals, it's contributing to better ecosystems out there. You know, they use less polluting materials, for one thing. It's better biodiversity. You know, if, if people use agroforestry, stra multi-strata agroforestry, or intercropping, which helps reduce soil degradation and soil loss and, and things like that. And, you know, helps better harvests. And I even saw this one video when, uh, was it New Zealand? They had some pretty intense flooding. And all the topsoil is just running down this hill. Because all you saw was like a field like this. And just all whatever crops are growing, monoculture of something. And the water is just whoosh, flowing all the way down, washing all that out. And the benefit of organic, you know? Just check out the history of these things. Where you get them? Um, I also got this chocolate from Dr. Bronner's, which I'm sure everybody knows about that. They have great products. You know? um, they also started making this chocolate bar, which they source their chocolate from Multistrata Agroforestry, which is really cool. So they have these very beneficial methods of harvesting these products, like the cacao and you know whatever else they plant in there. It can be I was going to say peanuts. <laughs> it could be like plantains or bananas or whatever. And, you know, it's just, it helps regenerate the soil and the microorganisms within the soil, which help a better ecosystem overall, not just for that plot, but for the surrounding environments too. Reduces the aerosol, the pollutant load into the environment, into the waterways. So, you know, everything you do matters. And I keep trying to tell my family and, and friends, man. I know you think it's, it might not matter, but it really does. And all the people that you might influence around you too. So I went to this coffee shop when I was working in downtown LA and I uh, stopped in for a really awesome burrito. I loved it, it was great. And I also got a chai too and they and they served, the first time I stopped in, they served it with a compostable cup, which was cool. So I wrote a review on Yelp. I just like to do that occasionally. And I said, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I'm in the environmental science field, so I take notice of these things. So, yeah. But what about the plastic straw you have? What about that plastic lid? What about that burrito wrap? Could be something else, too. Look into it, please. That was really nice about it. And so the next time I stopped in, they actually replaced that plastic straw with, like, a brown, you know, plant-based, whatever. Whatever it was. I actually asked them, but I didn't get a response yet. They liked my <laughs> review. So I acknowledged that, which was cool. But that, hey, just one small change. And I even brought it up to somebody else I know. And she she started composting products in her house. Like, I, I do that too. I'll take out my, my organic waste and take it to the local composting area. It's like, it's like a garden. And so I just drop it off there for them to use. And in my, in my plant starch bags. <laughs> and so anyways, she does the same thing. And then so she encouraged people around her to do it as well. She said, it's not that hard. It's not that challenging. Don't... Don't put too much weight upon what you want to do because it's not daunting at all. All you gotta do is just, you know, like my family, they think it's daunting. Like they tried it once, they fly problem. There are ways around that, so it doesn't have to be all bad. You know, come on, it's a natural part of the process. Flies are attracted to crap and decomposing things. It's all part of nature. It's all part of living. You know, just have to deal with it. 
And even still, it helps reduce the hydrogen, sulfide, and CO2, and methane contents that are leaked into the atmosphere, which, as it turns out, are still incredibly mind-boggling because, oh, we should definitely check out the, the uh, what, satellite imagery of the methane gets, that gets released from these landfills anyways, even though they try to prevent it. Ooh, man. It's pretty unfortunate, actually. It's still, it's still so much. And if you didn't see the satellite images, you'd, you'd think, well, they're doing their part. Because I actually worked with somebody. Oh, this poor guy. Ugh. I can't believe he didn't wear a whole hazmat suit when he was doing it. But it was for one of the projects I was working on. And he told me before that job, he was in the landfill monitoring all that. I'm like, oh, were you, were you wearing something to protect yourself? And he was like, no. Oh, so you're exposed to all that crap. I mean, everything goes in landfill. I don't even think I have to describe it. Just think of wastewater, but think of hard materials and everything else. All that stuff. Everything you can think of is there. And so being exposed to that. But anyways, so he mentioned the the methane that, you know, gets captured by these landfill systems. But apparently not good enough. So that's why we need to compost and get away from that. And you know, have our own little individual plots and all that kind of crap. And, and uh, so anyways, she... She can encourage people around here, and then just think if you can actually encourage more people around you, just have an effect like how a virus spreads easily, you know, word of mouth. All you gotta do is talk to somebody about it. There you go. So I'm gonna try and get my family to do it again. Mm, I'm pretty tough ones to crack, especially when it comes to the plastic water bottles. But, but I think I got that under control. I got them these really cool bottles. Oh, I'm gonna show you mine. So I got this from Cognitive Surplus. Really cool website to have, you know, everything that pertains to your career fields. Like, Michael, I got him a, <laughs> a cardiology mug when we first met, and it has a <laughs> it has a heartbeat on it, and shows a heart, like an image of a heart, and um, what was that called? Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on that. Oops, I guess I should ask him. <laughs> the heartbeat, it's oh PQRST. But anyways, so this one has. Um, DNA on it. Pretty neat. I have another one that has um, constellations. I have another one on tea chemistry. So I got my family, I got my mom <laughs> a chicken one. <laughs> it's all different little chickens on it because she's gonna get some, she's gonna add chickens to her garden so they can all have a nice cycle in the backyard. And instead of throwing all that organic waste away, they're gonna give it to their chickens now and or put it in their garden. Yeah, win-win. Awesome. Happy about that. So, anyways, getting from that plastic bottle, getting away from that, which I've been nagging on her and everybody else forever now. So I'm like, okay, if I can't beat them, maybe I should find something cool to supplement it with. Hmm. And so, got that, and then I got my sister a really cool one, and then my niece. So I know they'll use it because they're really neat. You know, one's a mountain scene with rivers, and the other one is birds all over it. Which I know my niece will, <laughs> she'll look them all up, and she'll probably tell me what they are. You know, just fun little challenging thing. Just like, look at that. You know, like. Hydroxyl group, and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, look, here's a DGP. I forgot what that is. It's been a while since I had genetics. <laughs> so, I don't know. I can't, I can't convince them with, you know, maybe it's too much sometimes. I just like beat people down with, like, hey, listen up. I know this stuff. You should listen to me. But, I mean, I try not to come off too harshly. Just, I want to tell them what I know, but. I don't know, I guess it doesn't always get interpreted properly. So I gotta find alternatives and different creative ways of doing that. So... Hmm. And I have other people to work on as well. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? Of course I mentioned this book, I only touched on it very briefly. But, longevity marker for your dog, the planet, and yourself. Yeah, I recommend it. And then also another one too, for humans as well. It's called The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. Pretty awesome. Um, I actually had, well, a discussion, put it that way, <laughs> with uh, some people on LinkedIn. And, you know, just Western medicine, like, animals are king, man. You need to have meat all the time. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. At least once a week. Once a month. Well, come on now. For one thing, all that meat is killing the planet. We don't need 93.8 oh, million cattle, heads of cattle. That is absurd. They destroy that land. It is ridiculous. 
not only do they destroy that land, they eat tons of food, you know, could be for other animals, the atmosphere as well. So they're very destructive. They're not great for your health, you know, in moderation. But they're, ugh, they lead to a host of health problems overall, especially how they're treated. If they're not fed properly, they should not be eating corn and soy, which they're fed copious amounts of. And then guess what? In turn, you're eating them as well. And so the sad thing about that for conventional farming is that cattle, they're fed, in his book, he mentioned this, which I don't know. I'm like, oh, interesting, sad, infuriating at the same time. They're fed essentially tums to neutralize the stomach acid because they're not capable of digesting that. So instead of feeding them the natural food like grass and letting them forage and eat whatever the hell they want, they're fed this crap which they shouldn't be eating nor should people be eating because it's all genetically modified and it's soaked in glyphosate. So how's that good for you anybody? You know? I mean, when the animals, they get processed, hey, guess what? They process those tumors out, too. So you might be eating a cancerous animal anyways. So, hey, you know, you might not get it right away, but I, I can't imagine that's great to eat an animal that's infected with the disease. Would you want to eat that? Hell no. Like, I kind of... I hate doing this, but... My dog, she eats raw meat. She eats a good, healthy diet, and I make sure she gets all the supplements she needs. So anyways, I bought this duck one time at 99 Ranch. I love that place. But when I was hacking away at it, um, I noticed a tumor in its tail. Ugh. It was like, maybe that big or so. Grayish, green. I'm like, oh, shit, should I feed this to <laughs> her? Oh, wait, I already noticed that after she started eating the meat. I'm like, crap. I know there's no indication, no real research out there that says, no, I don't feed your animal that because I know it happens all the time. I just don't know how healthy it is. But something like that bioaccumulate in you and then eventually show up you're expressing that as well because when you eat certain things it's really interesting about science too when what was it when mice are fed stool stool samples of healthy rodents um like or, or hold on wait, i got this wrong so when you what was it they took stool samples of obese mice or rats and they implanted it in healthy ones they in turn became obese oh that's pretty cool sad but interesting isn't it so, you know, if you were to eat something like that, it's still infected anyways, why wouldn't it contribute to your eventual demise or cancer, onset of cancer? I don't know, it seems kind of reasonable to me. You know, cancer take, can take anywhere of a decade to manifest in the body, but depending upon your exposure and how much you eat of whatever it is you're eating that's that you shouldn't be, it could be even sooner. You know? Uh, so, okay, what was I saying? Uh, cattle eating this stuff, should not be eating it, fed wrong, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh oh, hold on, I went too far off. <laughs> Song changed on me, too. Um, so, uh, wait, wait, wait. So, yeah, not feeding them the right things. You shouldn't be eating that. Contributes to cardiovascular disease. Neur uh, neuro, neurological problems. Alzheimer's. Oh, man, I forgot, was it AG1? I have to look it back up. But super cool book. I mean, he goes over a lot of stuff. It's funny because he's a little condescending in some parts, like for non medical people. <laughs> he likes to repeat things throughout the book, too, which I understand. Like, you know, if you, know, if you don't read the stuff all the time, you're like, what the fuck is a, a AGE? And I'm like, well, I don't know. You know? Yeah, repetition helps. I get that. So. But, uh, yeah, and then interestingly enough, too, you are what you eat, but old. A dodge really continues to fall into place nowadays. So, hmm. So, in his book, you can actually reverse diabetes, kidney failure, <laughs> asthma. Like, oh shit, I should. I'm sure I had this when I was a kid. COPD, you know, tons of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, Crohn's disease, skin disorders, psoriasis. Hmm. Um, I'm gonna butcher this one. I totally forgot to say it, even though I looked it up. Vitiligo? I don't know. It, that that disease where your skin pigmentation turns like, say, someone with a darker skin tone, their skin just starts turning white, or you know, lighter. You can reverse that. Isn't that cool? Wow. Oh, I love science. I love it. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, all this stuff kind of ties into each other, but um, hmm. What else did I mention? I mean, seriously, my woes are endless. My battery isn't, but I think I'm okay so far. I deleted some apps on my phone. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, jeez. Now what? Um. I don't know. Maybe I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'll just end it for now. So yeah, check out those books. Check out some other great. Okay, those two books and the Netflix. Great watches.